that one again. And that looks like it. <clears throat> All right, have I got the right screen on? Yes, I see it. You're good. Okay, brilliant. So, a quick introduction. Um, some of you uh, might be aware that I currently work for the Australian Research Data Commons. I joined uh, this year. However, prior to this year, I worked for over a decade uh, at UNSW within uh, Dementia Research Centre, the Centre for Healthy Brain Aging. So for today's talk, uh, I'm actually wearing my UNSW hat, uh, not my ARDC hat, and very specifically, my Centre for Healthy Brain Aging, or CHIBA hat. So. Um, yeah, try and keep that in your brains. Um, okay, so the Centre for Healthy Brain Aging established a research bank. Uh, it was called a research bank because it was a combination of a data bank and a bio bank. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about that and about our research agreements. Um, research agreements, again, we're using that generic term rather than data sharing agreements because technically the agreements also allow for the sharing of biospecimens. So a little bit about what we did um, or do. So our research was to collect data and biospecimens from a very vulnerable population, people with dementia or at risk of developing dementia. So people like the lady on screen who is my mother um, who has Alzheimer's disease, that's her for some reason wearing a floral headpiece that she would never normally wear and uh, showing her obsession now with, with plastic fruit. Um, I'm not quite sure what that's about, but uh, they're the kind of people that we were collecting data on. Uh, the reason we collected that data was for our own research, so to examine things like risk factors for dementia, um, to use that data as part of research collaborations, such as joining international consortia, uh, harmonizing our data with other international studies and performing mega analysis on those combined data sets. And then as I put there, any other appropriate purpose. So an example of that might be um, research that we had not envisaged at all, that's not normally part of our research. For example, we had uh, computer engineers and data scientists who were working on machine learning algorithms um, to improve the efficiency of uh, of analysing MRI brain images and, and they needed uh, training data sets for those algorithms and realised that we had data uh, that could be useful to them. Um, I've put uh, linked government records there in italics under the kind of data we collect. Obviously we don't collect that data, it is data that we uh, access though and use for our own research and that might pop up a little bit later uh, in my talk. Okay, so we were doing our own research, but as I said, we saw value in data sharing uh, for the broader benefits for research and society, but as, uh, as well for our own opportunities for research collaboration. So we had to consider how to share data in ways that was uh, not going to impact our own interests and rights as the generators of the data, uh, in ways that was ethical, uh, and also in uh, ways that was considerate uh, to legal requirements, uh, and um, considering, as we learn over time, uh, not being from legal backgrounds ourselves, that what we're actually talking about was intellectual property. Um, we had to revisit and review these things many times over the years uh, as the ethics requirements and research expectations around data sharing evolved. Uh, this involved iterative consultation with our researchers, uh, with our ethics committee and with the UNSW legal office to establish requirements and solutions. So the first thing that we needed to identify was what our primary investigators requirements were. <clears throat> um, obviously we had ethics uh, and other governance frameworks to comply with. Um, we had a requirement to review and approve uh, use of our data. Um, I put requirement in bold there. Again, that's something that was going to pop up a little bit later as I talk. Um, our, our rights to acknowledgement for any use of our data and something that we built into our agreement, which was the right to request involvement in a project accessing our data. It's different from authorship, uh, and it's not mandating that we have to be involved, but that we could request 
involvement in, um, in projects. So uh, this was all discussed and decided on quite early on and was distilled into a document containing our governance guidelines. That became a foundational reference document for our data sharing practices and a reference document cited repeatedly in ethics approvals and renewals over the years. Um, they were, these guidelines were established a decade ago and remain relatively unchanged over time. Uh, the next step was to address ethics requirements. So that's the requirements around consent for data sharing. Uh, and of course they have evolved. Um, the, the text that I have on screen is actually the current wording in one of our current consent forms. I thought some people here might be interested uh, to see a specific example. The key elements there which I've, I've highlighted are uh, the reference to future unplanned research, um, that the participants' privacy and confidentiality will be maintained, uh, and that we will control access to data. And you remember in the previous slide I highlighted uh, that requirement to review access to data now. Um, I'll say that that was, that was something that a decade ago we thought, well, yes, that seems like a sensible thing to do, but uh, when I get to the end of this talk, we'll see where that may be an issue moving into the future. Um, a key thing I'd highlight is that this is really essentially principles-based. It doesn't refer to specific procedures like uh, where the data will be stored or how the review or approval process will work. Um, this is in the participant information statement um, and so uh, ATREC deemed that the principles were sufficient um, there. Uh, a side point uh, that I'd note to, um, which is specific for human research where uh, participants are unable to provide consent themselves, such as in dementia. Um, uh, our HREC uh, required that we have two versions of our consent form, and a standard informed participant consent, um, where someone is compass and is able to provide consent for things like data sharing, um, or a, what they call a person responsible consent form. Um, so where someone is not compass where they have dementia, for example, and can can't provide informed consent. Um, I'll note for people who work in that area and wondering how to navigate that, that there isn't actually a legal or HREC definition for what a person responsible is. It's not necessarily the power of attorney or a guardian. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's deemed by, was deemed by UNSW HREC as, as appropriate at the time. Um, my suspicion with my research hat on is that that will probably evolve and become more clearly defined in the future. The other aspect of, of meeting our ethics requirements, um, so obviously getting uh, that consent um, or where that is not possible an HREC deems it's appropriate a waiver of consent to share data and we definitely were able to achieve that in some circumstances. Um, the other thing that HREC wanted to know were the clear details of how data may be shared. So not the principles based, but the actual uh, procedures. Um, here, we were able to refer back to that study governance guideline document. As I said, it was a very foundational document. Um, and for our individual studies, uh, we have those governance documents, but this evolved over time into the research bank. So the data biobank didn't exist initially. Um, it, it came over evolving um, needs or, or requirements from our HREC um, to establish something like that, but it really leveraged the same, uh, a lot of the same wording that was in the governance guidelines. Um, okay, so as it evolved, uh, details of study ethics application were updated to match this. Uh, so, in our ethics application, we reference both study governance guidelines and the research bank operational procedures. Uh, the last of those kind of three broad categories uh, of requirements to address were intellectual property. Um, so, when we proceeded to establish the research bank, it became apparent to us researchers, as I said, we don't have that background, that what we were dealing with was intellectual property. Um, and that we needed legal advice from the university. So UNSW Legal 
uh, has extensive experience, not necessarily in data, bank, data banks, although they had some, uh, but definitely in drafting agreements for sharing or collaboration around intellectual property. Um, so the things that we realized uh, through that consultation with legal that we had to address were not just who could use our data or our, or our background IP, but what everyone's rights were with respect to the project IP. So the, the findings that came out of the research or new data sets that were generated by use of our data. Uh, for those who don't have a background, IP is a very common clause in contracts, so we didn't need to reinvent any wheels. Uh, we just worked with UNSW's lawyers to identify the university standard approach and make sure it was um, appropriately, appropriately fitted to our use case. Um, another insight that we gained from going through this process uh, was that we realized we had to identify when a formal contract around data sharing was actually needed. Um, so we uh, definitely needed a formal binding contract when we were sharing data with researchers from other institutions. Um, if we wanted to share data uh, with researchers within UNSW but outside of our primary uh, investigative groups, so the people listed on our ethics approval, we didn't need a binding agreement. Um, we needed a non-binding MOU and I suspect a lot of researchers are familiar with that kind of thing uh, where you specify your expectations etc. Um, and a third type of agreement was a student deed poll. Um, I have to admit this was a requirement that I became aware of really just before I left UNSW. I'm not really an expert on this, but the, the purpose for that was essentially that even UNSW students aren't the same legal entity as UNSW staff. Um, so agreements and contracts with them needed to be different. The underlying point here is that um, you have to consider who was the legal entity that was actually going to be using your data and that would determine what kind of uh, contract you would need and whether it was a binding contract, so legally enforceable, or whether it was a non-binding contract like a memorandum of understanding. Um, so Ultimately, because even though we were uh, researchers in a research centre within UNSW, it's actually UNSW who's the legal entity, uh, and they're the ones who have authority to review and authorise any decisions and actions around uh, data sharing. Um, but that was ultimately, uh, for the most part, delegated to us researchers um, to figure out uh, how, to, how to implement this once they've kind of set the higher level context for us. Um, so just to uh, sum up um, those, those broad things that we had to address, uh, they're questions that we had to ask ourselves when someone was um, requesting access to our data. Um, I note the use of the term on provide there. So as I said in that earlier slide, we had linked government data. We weren't the legal owners of that data. We were allowed to use it by uh, the owners of that data, so perhaps it was Medicare or Department of Human Services, uh, but we didn't have the right to provide it on to uh, third parties. Okay, so looking at the process that we use to re um, review request to access data. Um, okay, so we had four stages. First was that someone interested in using our data had to submit a research proposal. We developed a standard template for this that recorded things like the applicant's details, their planned use of the data, their planned app, uh, publications or other outputs, uh, and we asked them to note their ethics approval details. Uh, this would then be reviewed by uh, the research bank and the study governance committee. Um, that was to ensure it met our ethical requirements, uh, so that requirement to control access to data, um, and it also allowed uh, us to meet that requirement of investigators um, to protect their interests and their um, rights to be involved in projects that use data that they generated. Uh, on completion of the review process, um, that's when we'd head into the formal uh, agreement stage, so that 
might be the, the binding contract, the MOU or the, or the deed poll, that was using those uh, contract templates that legal helped us draft. Um, and we also added in any special conditions of approval. So if, uh, if an external institution or researcher had a project that we had an interest in, uh, we could put as a special condition. Something like um, Professor uh, X uh, would like to be, would like the opportunity um, to be considered for involvement in this project. So again, it's saying we have an interest there, but we are, um, uh, I don't think, demanding uh, and saying we have to be involved, just can we have a discussion around this? And I think in most, most cases, the applicants were very happy for, um, to have that involvement from the primary investigators. Uh, the last step, of course, once you go through the application review and contract signing process is to uh, release the data. And we also had a requirement to monitor publications that were using our data. Also, if publication, uh, sorry, if, if data requests needed to be revised, so they wanted to produce more publications than they originally stipulated or required more data or, or changed the scope of the project in some way, um, then we needed to uh, track that as a contract variation. Um, for people who haven't had exposure to that, that probably sounds like a lot. It's like, oh, I've already signed a contract now, I've got to go back and redo it. It's most times it's quite a small thing and can just be agreed via an email once there's an initial contract in place. So that was the process. In terms of data sharing agreements, these were then the main components. So that final contract brings together things that I've been discussing up till now. So we had those standard researcher uh, requirements and terms of use uh, that are really stipulated there in the study governance guidelines. So again, foundational document, reuse, repurposed in the, in the data sharing agreement itself. Uh, we had the university's standard contract terms. So that was the um, templates that they uh, helped us draft. Uh, and really in, in data sharing agreement terms, that is the foundational document and things like the governance guidelines hang off of that. Um, and as I said in the, in the last slide, <clears throat> there was a, a research proposal. Um, so that formed an appendix to the data sharing agreement saying, well, this is, this is what we agreed uh, that you could do with the data. Um, and then the final bit was um, those special conditions if there were any on the data. So the pros and cons of, of something like this. So the pros uh, were um, quite significant. Um, over my time at UNSW at, at Chiba, which was about 11 years, we had over 300 requests to access our data. Now, we actually implemented the same process for our own staff and primary investigators uh, that we did for external people as well. That helped us streamline um, and manage uh, access and use of data and track it. Um, uh, but there were, you know, dozens, if not, uh, you know, well over a hundred uh, requests from external researchers. All of these 300 plus requests produced at least one publication or thesis, and more often than not, we were cited as co-authors. So there's a very clear, um, academic incentive to, to open your data in that sense. Um, after I left this year and since, uh, so since the end of March, uh, there have been um, 34 requests to access our data. Half of these uh, were from outside the primary investigator group and, and almost all of those were from other universities and institutions. Uh, the other thing about having a data sharing agreement is that it very clearly defines the terms, the process. Um, and what we found is that although there's a lot of academia works on goodwill, having clearly defined terms uh, acts as a good failsafe because there will be a small percentage of, of occasions where you're sharing data where generally not from any poor intent, but just a 
misunderstanding about what the terms of sharing are. Um, uh, having having documents like this gives you something to refer back to. Um, I assure my coast presenters that I'm almost done. I really that I'm going over time. Um, so the costs of, of setting up something like this, well, it is the cost to set up something like this and to main, maintain the processes and systems, but then also to manage uh, the ongoing requests and releasing the data. Um, my centre had dedicated funding towards this, so uh, that's how we were able to do that. Um, another con is unanticipated scenarios for data sharing. So one example is uh, more recently we had a, a private company, commercial entity in the EU, who wanted to use our data um, to identify new ways of assessing biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so very worthwhile research. Uh, we weren't too sure about it though because we hadn't really been approached by a private company before we went to UNSW ATREC and they said, well, no, you haven't explicitly said that you're going to share with commercial entities. Um, so, uh, so you're not allowed to do it. Um, I had a separate conversation in more recent months with a contact at NHMRC and, and this story came up. Um, and I won't name names, but they were somewhat outraged that that was the interpretation uh, by UNSW HREC because they felt that it wasn't in line with NHMRC's um, data sharing aspirations. However, I think what that highlights is maybe a gap between um, principle-based policy around data sharing uh, and then the requirement of each separate organisation to interpret those principles into their own policy. Um, I, I highlighted already that there, we had a requirement which we uh, promised to our participants that we would um, review who would access uh, their, their data. Um, why I wanted to highlight that was you know, how once the project ends or once the primary investigators are no longer available um, to manage request access data, how are we going to do this in the long term? Um, I don't have an answer for that. It's something that only more recently has you know, uh, occurred to me. So I just flag that as something that, you know, uh, I think we were probably ahead of the curve in terms of data sharing, data sharing agreements, but this is something that we haven't um, really addressed yet. Um, and then the other con, and this is something that's uh, only become clear as we've been implementing this more formal rigorous contract process, is the time that it actually takes to go through that uh, legal step of signing a contract. Um, to put some numbers to that, this is the time frame. So since those 34 applications uh, that we've received since the end of March, the review stage, so when the primary investigators um, view the, the project and say, yep, we're happy with this. On average, it's been about a week. Um, the longer, uh, you see that there's, a, there's an upper range of 66 days to approve a project. Uh, I can show you that tends to be when the applicant has um, been slow to respond to follow-up questions uh, or before for they, when they submitted the application, they didn't take the time to understand our data collections or availability or terms of use. And so we had to go back and have, you know, uh, have those conversations after they'd already submitted an application. Um, the thing that has kind of really blown out and we don't have much control over is that uh, contract negotiation and signing stage. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see there, that's, that's up to close to three months. However, the median is one day. So for um, internal researchers and students, once, once the committee approves the data access and signing the contract's very quick. But when you've got a contract template that has to go to an external university and their legal office, then they have their standard set of terms around uh, intellectual property and sharing of data and, and negotiation process goes on that is, um, let's say it's a little bit slow. Um, 
and then the other aspect of that is, uh, in the time frame there is the data access as you can see again it goes up to uh, three months there's a very specific reason for that that's not the standard turnaround time as I said this is uh, numbers reflecting what's happened since March and that was after I left so and there was other staff turnover so new people had to take over this um, they were loading the job and we also had the COVID disruption um, <clears throat> and yeah so I don't think that number is truly reflective of how long it takes to actually release data um, okay, so that's pretty much it. I would just like to express my thanks to Vivica, Susie and Ginny, um, who after I left had to uh, pick up all the pieces that I had um, uh, I'd left for them to do. Uh, so thank you very much. That's Chiba's links and socials and thanks for the opportunity to present. Uh, fantastic. Thanks, Kristen. Um, that was brilliant. Uh, so um, I think we'll go straight on to um, Fiona's presentation. And then, um, as I said, if anyone has questions for Kristen, if you could add them to the chat and we'll um, address them in the general discussion at the end. Uh, so Fiona, if you can share your slides. Okay, well, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to come and talk to you. Um, so this kind of grew out of some work I've been doing at UTS since I've been there um, since the beginning of this year. Um, and we started having, and we knew this must be a problem which other institutions are facing. And so started having, having a chat with some other people about what they're doing in this space. And is there a way in which we can um, make it easier for our researchers to share data. So coming at this from, and I mean, what I'm going to talk about is will be much more sort of high level and breezy than the, um, the level of detail and rigor, which um, Kristen's just talked about with their data sharing agreement. So um, as an institution, um, data gets shared a lot all the time. Um, researchers share data, the university shares data. Um, so researchers may be collaborating formally on a project. They may be sharing data informally with, um, with colleagues. Um, researchers themselves um, or their own future selves are also a significant um, consumer of, of data, sometimes outside of the original context in which it was collected. Um, so as researchers move institutions that they want to have continued access to the data that they collected um, and particularly in um, long running projects that they want to be able to continue to use these high value data sets as they move around institutions. Uh, from the university's perspective, um, there's all sorts of data that we send out, administrative data for reporting um, and um, for describing our own activities. Um, where I think there's a significant gap um, where universities could be sharing data much more effectively is actually with our own researchers. Uh, so one of the, um, you know, we've got these communities of, of fascinating people doing all sorts of interesting things. And I think there's an opportunity for universities to benefit immensely from the, the expertise that we have within our own walls. I mean, one of the examples, um, I worked at the University of Melbourne and there's significant campus redevelopment going on there. And, you know, we had people uh, talking very excitedly about treating the campus as a living lab and what sort of opportunities did we have for data collection and for learning more about how space is used and how we can optimize space. Um, you know, and we have a whole community of researchers who, are, who work in urban planning and particularly people who work on topics like urban greening, uh, who are really interested and were really keen to be involved in this uh, sort of project, apparently keeping trees alive in paved areas. Uh, it's a problem which was of interest to some of the researchers that they were really keen to um, be able to stick a bunch of sensors in the ground as the construction work uh, was underway and just finding the, the channels for them to be able to talk to the right people to pitch their project to get the sensors in the ground to have some agreement about who was going to have access and um, ownership of the data if that that project went ahead was a much more complicated process than i think it needed to be 
Um, and then there's uh, data, which is kind of research data, but is, isn't so much the property of one particular researcher, but is held in a, a GLAN collection, um, a library or an archive of the university. And so how uh, access to that is managed, getting both um, internal and external uh, researchers access to, to that sort of data. So there's, I mean, you know, you all, you all work in and love this space, so I'm, I'm not telling you anything particularly new by saying that there's lots of data and lots of people would like to use it for lots of things. Um, so within the, um, so what we wanted to do was to create a base template that would help to um, ease that, that process for researchers of um, sharing data, particularly um, addressing the need of a researcher leaving the institution that they and who would like to take a copy of their data for um, ongoing future use um, and researchers sharing data among themselves. We had a few instruments at our disposal already. We had um, the materials transfer agreement, but that was very much geared towards sharing of physical stuff. It's when you send biospecimens um, to a research partner um, and the research office in particular didn't really deem that a suitable instrument for um, handling data sharing. We also have a template agreement for um, sharing of student IP because students are um, slightly different from regular staff members in that they, they own their IP. And so if a student has done a, um, a project as part of a bigger um, research lab, uh, how do we make sure that the university has the right to archive and continue to use data which has come out of a student project. So we did have those instruments in place, um, which were um, were part of a, a, what we what we looked at when sort of creating the space agreement. We also had a look at um, the Osgol licenses, which um, some people will, will remember, um, and the template agreement, which the Office of the National Data Commissioner has put out. And it seemed, so what we would wanted to create was something a bit like the Creative Commons license suite, that we wanted something that would be um, quite simple and straightforward um, for researchers to understand and to be able to customize according to their needs, um, something that could be made appropriate to their research um, project. Um, ideally some sort of a workflow or a wizard um, but you know starting small um, a flowchart and a form is where we're at at the moment um, it needed to be um, sensitive to the uh, the nature of research that there are um, things in you know conditions in something like I mean the ONDC um, template for instance tent is working on the assumption that data is being shared between agencies and that there is um, that there are comparable terms um, that both parties can rely on and I think um, you know research is um, there are a number of, of things that make a research project a bit different uh, particularly the expectation that the outcomes will be communicated and shared um, when the, um, the folks from the, the BI team had a look at the the template I prepared for research and there was a, a clause in there about acknowledging UTS as the source of the data. They, one of their questions was, but what if we don't want to be acknowledged? Um, which may be the case when you're, if you're sharing administrative data for reporting purposes, but when you're sharing research data, um, it's unlikely that you would not want to be um, acknowledged as the originator of that data. And also recognizing that research is open end, that questions check open ended, that questions change, and particularly thinking about um, a researcher leaving the institution, um, that it's more difficult to define tightly define the project a project um, for which the data may be used because you know they may not know yet what their next big project's going to be. And so finally, and this is um, what. So partly to do um, with what Kristen was talking about, um, getting things comparable across institutions is, is also difficult. One of the thing, one of the conditions that I wanted to put in um, was that you know data should not have a lower security classification applied um, by the recipient than it had at UTS. Um, but that requires that you're able to um, 
translate in some way what um, you know what does something being UTS sensitive mean um, at, the at the receiving institution so that's um, working out those equivalences um, I think is going to be one of the challenges so where we're at at the moment um, we've gone with the decision tree um, because we do want the template to be able to accommodate uh, different scenarios so um, the decision tree asks the researcher questions like, you know, is there personal information in your data? If yes, um, go to privacy. Um, is commercial use of the data permitted? Um, if yes, you know, insert these clauses. If no, insert these clauses. Uh, so we've got um, a plain English agreement, um, which will describe the um, the the, da the data that's being shared and the um, nature of the receiving pro project. And then underneath that, we have um, the formal um, legal terms and conditions um, to, to back up that template. But I've really wanted to make sure that we had a plain English, uh, that plain English version up the front uh, so that it was the intention um, of the agreement would be really clear. At the moment, um, with research and administrative purposes are being um, handled differently, and it just sort of it wasn't practical to have um, or the, the, the what I wanted to see in the in the template for researchers um, and what the um, the the business side wanted to be able to put into their agreement. Um, weren't wasn't going to mesh happily into a single template so at the moment those two um, agreements are separate documents um, where we're at at the moment um, we're road testing the agreement uh, the first request has come in um, that we're, we're trying trying out um, it's a request for access to data that's actually held in our in our in an archival collection of the university. So working with the library on that um, and particularly um, agreeing what is um, acceptable conditions for the data to be held in and what we mean by you know, treating the data securely has um, proven to be um, the area where we need to do a little bit more thinking, I think, about how the, how the template comes together and what our expectations are. Um, at the moment, as I said, it's a it's a word document. Um, we would really like to be able to see this built out into a wizard or a tool um, that a researcher could click through and that would build um, a base agreement for them um, that they could then uh, customize. Um, and so, as we sort of look beyond. Um, our own walls um, and why it's so great to be able to talk to a community like this um, is I think that there's if we can uh, think about building consensus among institutions about what a data sharing agreement looks like what are minimum requirements um, are there terms that we can understand um, or build a common understanding of I think that will um, uh, that will assist the process greatly and um, as part of the institutional underpinnings uh, project, which I, the AIBC is supporting for uh, next year, uh, I would really like to be able to do some, to take that opportunity to work with um, other participating institutions towards um, uh, doing some more work on common terms and um, agreement, terms and conditions for um, a data sharing agreement, which, you know, Ultimately, perhaps the dream is for a, um, a nationally accepted template agreement that uh, researchers can uh, feel confident to um, use themselves um, for sharing data. So that was all I wanted to, to share with the group today. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Fiona. And um, finally, uh, we'll be hearing from Steve um, about his perspective on the um, ONDC's uh, data sharing agreement template. Um, so Steve, if you'd like to share yep. your screen. Uh, so then I'll share me and then try and get rid of me. Um, 
and I will share screen. You know, so I have three screens sitting in front of me. So I will hopefully get the right one at this point. There we go. <laughs> uh, okay, it's that one for now. Let's see how this works. When I move to, nope. I will, sorry. I'll switch the screens here. Uh, Okay, there we go. So um, I think just a, a, an administrative matter, Angela is having all sorts of fun with waiting rooms. So you might see a, a message about waiting rooms popping up periodically because I'm one of the co-hosts. Um, I say we'll, we'll manage that as best we can. Um, but in the meantime, I will be talking a bit to uh, the uh, a really nice segue from what both Kristen and um, Fiona have uh, have presented. Fiona finished up her, her points on saying, could we have a template national data sharing agreement? Uh, I'm going to talk about one of those templates, um, <laughs> which is coming from the Office of the National Data Commissioner. We've talked extensively in, the, um, in this um, working group, uh, in this community practice, sorry, about um, what's coming with the the uh, the data um, the DAT bill um, uh, from the Office of the National Data Commissioner? Um, so there's a really nice segue there, actually, um, between the two. I'm my aim here today is not to either champion or um, dismiss what the the ONDC has done. It's just to really walk through what's in there, and then you know picking up on what um, my colleagues have already talked about is to say, okay, well. You know, is there stuff here that might be relevant? Is this the right sort of framing? Knowing that that also that we have a, you know, certainly at the federal level, a legislative framework coming, which is likely to incorporate some of these discussions. Um, and I so I really like Fiona's last point about, you know, thinking about what a, you know, sort of some sort of collaborative arrangement across institutions. And here I would define both um, government and academic and uh, uh, other research institutions and, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You know, um, uh, you know, uh, non-government organisations and others as well might think about uh, that. Might be overly ambitious, but I say I think we, you know, there's a lot of common interest here. And um, uh, as uh, Kristen's um, time timeline slides point out, there's potentially a lot of waste, not wasting, but a lot of time involved, uh, potentially time wasting uh, that might be involved um, uh, around this. Um, uh, if we, you know, we're putting our heads together and trying to do something collaborative here might well be of use. So I'm going to walk through just what's in there and just some commentary, you know, um, and I don't claim any, you know, personal authorship on this. I have um, basically picked up what's in the, the data sharing template uh, and just, you know, highlighted the, the, the content that's there and just some commentary on the way through, Part, mostly just to highlight you know that these are the things that the being thought about from um, the the ONDC um, and uh, and others, and might be you know in consultation with government agencies as an academic researcher and, and working for an academic data sharing organisation in collaboration with government. You know what are my reflections upon that? Um, so just for those who haven't um, uh, been in the space here, I've just picked up what, what are the ONDC trying to do promote greater use of public sector data, drive innovation from the use of public sector data, and build trust with the community around government's use of data. So it's a very much oriented around support for you know, access to government data and use of government data. Um, but as heavy users of that, um, uh, that uh, government data, as one part of the, uh, um, the research environment, um, you know, uh, the academic community has a, a strong interest here as well. And there is, you know, um, that we want to be conscious of uh, and, and certainly inter interact with them on a regular basis. Um, so, so this is, you know, this document has been out since March of this year. Uh, the, uh, you know, there's the link at the top of the page here. And I say, I'm just reproducing, you know, literally um, uh, uh, content um, out of either the website or, or out of the, I see the, the, the structure of the document itself and some brief commentary. Uh, what's it trying to do, this template? Well, I say, picking up from where Fiona got to, it's fundamentally trying to highlight um, where there might be some template uh, content that we can start working towards. So this is not 
filling in the gaps as to what your institution would say, but or what are the sorts of questions you would ask. So it's really from the point of view of a data provider, I think, as much as anything. Uh, and one of the things as a data user, or as in fact, I'm an intermediary for the most part, uh, the Australian Data Archive works with agencies uh, and researchers to connect the dots between the two. How do we get you know, data, you know, you know, data sharing occurring um, between, uh, between agencies and users in an effective way. Um, so, you know, this is a, you know, likely to be, I negotiate, you know, um, on a fairly regular basis, you know, sharing agreements with government to facilitate access for, re for researchers writ large. So I'm not talking on a project by project basis. What I'm trying to do is sort of set up a framework whereby uh, we might enable, you know, um, not unspecified use, but a, a, a framework whereby we can leverage ADA's existing uh, data access protocols and procedures um, to enable access to data with the relevant participation of different parties in the process. Um, so this template really is, as I say for me, is I'm likely to be a user of this template in my discussions with government going forward. So what are the, what's the template trying to do? Implement the best practice guidelines, um, work, help government agencies produce agreements to share data effectively. Um, and say so it's been worked in consultation with stakeholders and it's designed to be legislation agnostic. So this was developed prior to the DAT bill, you know, going out in practice. And it's not intended as an implementation of the DAT bill, you know, whatever passes, because that you know, might still be some time away. It's likely to go before the parliament soon, but it's still, you know, there's still some work to be done there uh, and the specifics will be, you know, will be laid out. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really framing up what are the, the, the sections of the discussion as much as anything. So you can kind of see that the work that's already gone on from the ONGC in there, um, as I, uh, and probably anticipating, but not dependent upon what passes through the bill uh, that might go through the parliament. So, you know, so what am I trying to do? As I said, you know, this is a lay person's view. I'm, you know, my, I put my caveats at the bottom there. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not speaking on behalf of any of the, the, the parties involved here. It's really based on my own experience working you know, um, here at ADA. But I say it's not an ANU position, it's not an official ADA position, um, and certainly it's not the ONDC's position. I'm not, you know, I have no role directly with um, uh, the government in this way. I'm a regular contributor to some of the consultation processes that are involved. So I'm really just trying to think here about what are some of the impl possible implications here for the institutions and researchers um, as potential parties to this agreement, uh, this or a temp agreement that might be developed from this template. Um, and really thinking here, so I think reflecting upon what Kristen and Fiona have just talked about, you know, this is, you know, it, what would you do uh, as a group? I'd like to think about what would we do is if we were to developing an agreement where we were the recipient of data, the user of data, um, and having to negotiate it, you know, part of this discussion. So, you know, one of the things to think about here is, well, how would we populate the content that's going to go through here? Okay, so I say from here, it's really, I'm just for the most part picking up the, you know, the, the content of the bill, uh, the uh, template agreement itself, and just want to reflect on something as I go through. So the basic elements of the, the, the draft agreement template are this. It outlines the parties, the purpose, uh, the duration, the data sharing principles. So you know, read here the five safes, um, but as I say, as the ONDC have taken that further, um, their um, interpretation of, you know, what was found in the five phase, but is their data sharing principles uh, and aligning that with their best um, uh, best practices uh, guidelines uh, that were published around about the same time. Um, so as I say, those principles will be embedded in the, the, the legislation um, and are similar principles are certainly embedded in the, as I understand, the South Australian legislation as well. So you know, we can kind of see these as kind of a framing there are limitations to them, uh, and uh, certainly in discussions, uh, even yesterday I was involved in a, a, a workshop with IATSIS and, and others where you know, recognising limitations for, you know, for example, for Indigenous data or for uh, working across institutions. But they're a foundation though that we can start with. And then there's other things, other conditions and arrangements and supplementary information. But for the most part, the core of the, the, the template is really reflecting upon the data sharing principles uh, and the and frankly, I think on the purpose, uh, I want to touch upon what what's there and, and how we might think about using that going forward. Um, so 
it, if we start with the parties to the agreement, the actual um, the template agreement actually specifies organisations, not individuals. So it say, um, and you know, not every data sharing agreement is actually an agreement between organisations, but um, certainly that you know, the, the elements here are orienting around organisations rather than individuals. Um, so uh, and specifying particular roles, either as custodian, intermediary, or or as user. Um, so as I say, I'm. Uh, for, for many of us, we might be custodians, but you know, here, um, where this would likely be used would be as an intermediary or as a user. Um, for those thinking about the DAP as well, I think that you know, we can expect and the, the language that's included in the document there is it's equivalent to an accredited data service provider is what an intermediary represents here. So someone who's providing either data sharing or data linkage services Right now, that's an accredited integration authority, um, and we have colleagues from some of those organisations on the on the meeting today. Um, but as I say it's likely to be, you know, read here, accredited data service provider um, is how you might think about that going forward. It it may, you know, it doesn't necessarily require that, um, but you know, if this was formalised, you know, we can kind of read that into that that situation. So I guess the starting things I would think about here is all as I say, what about unnamed parties? Is it the capacity, the capacity to be looking at a, an agreement? You know, but for, for ADA's point of view, we facilitate support um, access for a large number of users across many organisations. How do we incorporate those unnamed parties here? Well, that, that may not be directly relevant. So it, what we would think about instead is some of the on sharing of data and the dissemination processes that you might think about there. Um, you know, so those unnamed parties, individuals and other organisations might be, you know, it might be relevant here. Um, uh, in the current template, individuals in, in named organisations uh, can actually be specified in section 4.8 of the agreement. So there is capacity to incorporate um, uh, individuals into this. Um, the interesting question I think is, you know, there is can or must, you know, if you can't have you know, uh, unspecified entities in there, you know, that's, if you're negotiating one of these agreements, that might be one of the questions is, can you extend, how do you extend? Christian kind of touched upon that in reviewing, you know, data sharing agreements as well. Um, the broad um, uh, statement in item two then is really about purpose. Um, so the, the, the items you see in there, purpose of the data sharing project, um, you know, so what's the overarching type or types of purpose? I kind of frames it really consistent with where the, I think the DAT bill legislation is heading as well. Is it for you know, research and development? Is it for, you know, what's the public benefit you know, outcome that you're, you're kind of targeting here? Uh, and what's the specifics of the project and can incorporate sub projects? And you're asked to include you know, specific details there. And then how the data shared will assist in achieving that purpose. So it's not, you know, so it's the broad purpose and then specific projects that will be undertaken. Um, so one of the questions in framing up some of these, these agreements might be, well, how comprehensive will the purpose need to be? Uh, and what if new purposes emerge? How do you, you know, it, you know is there a mechanism for adding purposes um, that you, you might be thinking of here or adding projects? We're actually having some of these discussions and a, a challenge in, in this, in working with one of our uh, partner organizations. Um, you know, finding this quite difficult. How do you think about what might be a research program of an institution or a, a, a research centre? How do you expand upon that? That that becomes, practically speaking, rather challenging. Uh, and how do you model that? And that's probably for our template discussion example, that's one of the things that we at ADA are thinking about quite hard because we're finding it difficult to think about that interaction of people and projects into a broader research program. Um, and that's one of the spots where the five safe starts to fall down is you don't actually have, you have safe projects, but not a broader program in which those program, projects operate. Um, item three talks about duration. Um, so the duration of the agreement itself. Um, yep, <laughs> so Fiona's you know, kind of picking up here, but where this goes to next, which is, you know, what's the end date? Yeah, I mean, this is specifying the agreement at intervals for review, will it be a one-off or a periodic sharing of data? So when you have time series or you know real-time data, you know um, you're know, going to be particular with administrative data. You can see how this you know uh, a regular feed becomes important. Um, you know, sort of is this is you know is this one-off or or, or or so some sort of periodic arrangement? What that might be. 
can it be rolled over? The, the, the terminology that they're suggesting, you know, the implication is yes, sort of involving agreements are, are relevant here. Um, in my experience, um, the, that's one of, the, one of the challenges as well, which is um, having a finite end date or at least a review period um, means you can say, okay, well, you know, uh, when do we finish access? You know, uh, and that sort of evolution um, of that, you know, the end of the project becomes, you know, difficult. New, new questions emerge. It ties into that sort of, you know, project and program development. How do you renegotiate those is something you I say, I like the terminology thinking around review because it does imply that you might revisit that. Um, but as I say, the, the sort of the, the finite end tends to be, in, in my experience, you know, positively received. It's like, okay, we, we, we've got until that point in, in time from the point of view of the data provider, uh, and then we might negotiate a new agreement. How do you build in those sorts of review processes effectively is something that, um, uh, you know, somewhat, somewhat of a challenge. Um, the item, and then item four is really where the heart of the agreement, you know, the template actually comes from, and it lays out the, 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 the data sharing principles that, you know, and, you know, what we would term the five sites, you know, in a broader framework. Projects, people, settings, outputs, data, you know, is really the, the elements there. So here's, you know, um, starting to, you know, fundamentally each of these sections kind of ask you to lay out some of the specifics of how this will operate in, in practice. Uh, where, and I think the broad comment I would make here is this work threads sharing a, a specific set of content, um, but how you embed this into a broader program or a, a broader collection of data is where this starts becoming challenging and where, you know, um, uh, we might hit some difficulty in using this sort of framing. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the basic, you know, project statements, you know, what's your consent procedures? You know, what were the, you know, are you gonna require approval processes? So here's where the interaction between the institution and the data provider, is, sorry, the institution and user and the data provider as provider and potentially the intermediary as, as having to confirm these things becomes, you know, a lot more involved. You know, Christian sort of talked about some of the timeframes that are involved there. Uh, and this is, you know, I have two staff, you know, fundamentally who, you know, this is what they spend their time on is reviewing and ensuring that there's enough information to at least be able to make a decision on these things. Not actually making the decision themselves, but passing that information through. Um, so where is the, you know, the public interest? What are the procedures that you're using here? What are the circumstances under which you can share data? Um, so we have agreements whereby we are approved by the, the data provider to um, approve access for certain types of users or certain types of projects, but not others. Um, and what are, the, you know, what are the circumstances where you've got to return to the provider? You know, so negotiating these, these processes um, uh, 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 for a specific data set and a specific project um, is relatively streamlined, but for a broader program can be, can be challenging. Uh, can you really, and how do you release outputs? And this is the one that's often, you know, uh, uh, the IP sort of questions and the, the, the academic freedom questions um, and the moral rights questions. This is, you know, what are you gonna put into that? How do you negotiate that with the agency that you're dealing with? Or if this is a template for use in other spaces, and I'm not suggesting that it is right now, but uh, you know, again, how do you, you know, uh, who gets credit for what? How do you, you know, review and, and, and confirm the appropriate use of something? Um, yeah, that, that, that starts to you know, you know, kick in there. Um, there's a statement on intermediaries. So as I said, the accredited data share service providers is you know, um, kind of starting to be embedded within this template as well. You can kind of read these in and you might be thinking about that going forward. You know, what's the set of infrastructures that are going to be relevant here? So as, as, as intermediaries, um, you may want to be thinking about what your what you need to get incorporated in here to meet your obligations, both to users and to uh, data providers or custodians. Um, you know, so what are the data services that are, are going to be provided? Um, what are the you know um, conditions under which the data sharing can be done, and what will happen to data at the end of the project? Um, you know, so in, end of life sort of questions here. Um, we have different agreements whereby there isn't you know, a, 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 an end date on some agreements, there is on others. You know, do you include review processes? Again, Kristen kind of touched upon this. What happens on the appropriate use after the, the first project is finished? 
particularly if you're, you know, from, from ADA's point of view, we largely deliver, you know, data delivery, you know, through through a web download. Um, so monitoring after the fact. Um, you know, do you do that? What sort of, you know, checking do you provide? Um, there's sections on people. Uh, so, you know, certainly you can specify personnel in here. Um, uh, are there any additional requirements that need to be met? Uh, you know, example of this might be, you know, the ABS has their um, data lab training. Uh, what, you know, uh, uh, the Erica team um, at um, UNSW uh, have, you know, researcher training. Do you have training needs? Do you have ethics requirements? You know, internal review. And from an organizational point of view, that, that second statement, details of persons who are responsible for ensuring the requirements are satisfied. Do you have your internal procedures set up effectively at your institution to ensure that you have your oversight of these processes if it is required? Um, you know, so how do those processes flow down through your institution? Because it's the organization, the institution, the university in my case, that is the signatory to this agreement, not the individual. So how, you know, what are your, your obligations there? And what relevant, you know, uh, will the data custodian or intermediary provide support as well? Um, so again, this is the intermediary maybe if you think about the, their obligations here. Um, so there's a lot of uh, settings. Um, how will the data be shared? Where will it be stored and accessed? Um, are you using a secure lab? Are you, you know, where are you storing the data itself? Um, oh, excuse me, I'm just gonna make some water. These sorts of implications. Physical environments, technical safeguards, etc. Um, data security. Data, um, you know, what data then on the data itself? What's the data that's going to be shared? Will any treatments be applied? You know, there's quite a lot of detail you could incorporate here. Do you have answers to these questions as you go through, either as a provider or as a user? Um, because if you don't, then this is where a lot of the negotiations that um, Kristen and, and Fiona talked about. This is where the, the time frames you know, pick up. It's we don't have standard answers here, or we don't have agreed answers here, and populating that information can take a lot, you know, uh, take a lot of time. In my experience in working with agencies, um, I tend to start the the the, the, the legal you know sharing you know discussion and the the processing and data um, uh, data management discussion at about the same time. And it's very rare that we don't have the data ready, you know, um, ready well ahead of the actual um, uh, final agreement being, you know, being finalised. I um, mean, it's, it's this sort of detail that, that um, uh, takes much more, you know, can be done in parallel, but it often takes more time than the actual, you know, the, the data management side that, that's going on. Uh, and then, you know, from the point of view of the institutions and also from the point of view of the data providers, remember what's the concern of the data providers is well, you know, what, you know, um, you know, what's going to be said about this at the end of the process? You know, what overview do we have of the outputs that are coming through? From the point of view of the agent, uh, the, the researcher and the, and the institution, what are we expecting to get at the end of it here? And how do you negotiate those things? Um, so the IP discussions that people were talking about, um, you know, I think starting to think about, you know, what, what are our expectations here and codifying some of those is going to be much more important because we have standard language that doesn't always meet the, the needs of the other party. What are the, the mutual obligations we might have that we could possibly formalize? And I don't know if that's possible or not, but it's something to think about. Um, the last parts that are there, what are you going to do about data breaches? Who will be responsible for them? And other, you know, other information that goes in there um, and approves. But you can kind of see this is, you know, every one of these things, this is 13 pages without any content. My sense of this is, you know, you could be well be looking at a document that, uh, you know, even before you've actually got something that's finalised, just drafting this is, you know, um, significant amounts of content potentially in every one of those items that, 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 that appears on the page here. Um, but there's also the case, and I think Fiona really reflected upon this, that a lot of these could well be populated, you know, to at least some degree in advance. You know, we know our answers here, but we possibly haven't documented, sorry, we possibly haven't written them down in the way that we might expect in the past. So can we start thinking about ways of actually populating something like this agreement or similar agreements that Fiona talked about, whereby we know a lot of the answers to this and then we tailor it to the specifics? Because this is just a template for the questions that are being asked. 
what templates have we got on the answers is you know a, a whole nother discussion um there's a you know a, this is why we get the sort of time frames that Kristen is talking about here um so some future considerations and questions for the, the group here has anyone had experience of you know the, this has been around for about nine months now what was your experience i haven't had to negotiate using this te template directly but certainly some of the flavors of what I've seen are reflective of the five safes, the data sharing principles, you know, in general. Um, uh, how might we develop that, that sort of template response content? Um, you know, examples being phys physical IT environment, you know, ISO 27001 is that, you know, you've often in accreditation procedures, you've got content that would probably populate this. Um, core trust seal content, we, we, we've gone through accreditation there. Some of that's relevant, I would think. And then how might these template options interact with the forthcoming DAT bill? ADSBs, accredited users, um, I think, you know, um, there's also the content here that um, uh, the sharing of approved agreements is, um, there is language in the bill which proposes sharing of approved agreements. Um, so, I mean, you know, how do COP members feel about you know, that, 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 approve, that agreement, or at least some information about that agreement might be shared in this process. I, you know, my personal position is actually that's a good thing, that it, it makes transparent the, the and build, should help to build trust in the use of a system like this. But there are implications and there are, you know, IP and commercial imperatives that might be mitigating against that as well. And we, you know, how do we, how do we engage with those? So I'll leave it at that um put those on the table as uh, you know in a few times there's just some, some contact details there but to say i might just leave the uh, those questions up on the screen um for folks to consider and uh, we, we sort of we're hoping now to sort of engage in a discussion as to you know what sorts of issues are coming up for the the, the community in, in this